Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Scrimper live stream on a Wednesday. Yay! And today I am very pleased to be joined by Nadia Zouk, who is a self-taught software engineer who came from a non-technical background, broke into tech, which I'm sure many of you can relate to. So you're going to get tons of brilliant advice from Nadia. Big thank you, Nadia, for joining us. Excellent to have you here. Thank you. Now, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure. As I mentioned, you're a self-taught software engineer at Intercom, also a volunteer at Women Who Code and Code Your Future, which are two organizations which teach people to code, basically. Very exciting came from a non-technical background in journalism, learned to code without a boot camp, and is now passionate about helping other people to break into tech, basically. We've got a range of things to talk about today, including excuses people make to not learn to code, a step-by-step -step guide for teaching yourself code, job hunt tips, tips for new programmers, coping with stress, and my personal favorite, dealing with jerks. So <laughs> looking forward to that. But as uh, Nadia said, if you have any questions of your own, pop them in the chat. That's the reason we do these things live. So we know we're answering the questions that you want the answers to. So yes, big warm welcome to you. Thank you for coming once again. And um, let's start with a little bit about your background so it was in journalism I understand and you decided to learn to code one day how did that happen uh yeah first of all thank you for the wonderful intro uh so basically yeah my first career was actually in journalism so I worked in, as an editor and a journalist at an independent uh news magazine back in Belarus um it lasted for a couple of years but then we decided to close down the magazine and I really didn't want to do anything else related to politics or journalism uh but I knew that I wanted to move from Belarus to Poland and um I kind of had a uh, period where I wasn't really sure what I want to do with the rest of my life. Uh, and at that point, I was 25. Uh, but after some thinking and market research uh, and talking to people, I understood that probably learning technical skills would be my surest way to be successful when I moved to another country. And basically, it would be the best way for me to start a new life in a new country. Um, so that was kind of the reasoning behind me. Um, lean into technical skills uh, but before that i didn't have any experience with coding um tech or anything like that so i really started learning from zero and yeah i started learning on my own um, i wanted to go to a boot camp but i couldn't afford any of the boot camps that were available back then uh, in the ruby on rails so um and i didn't want to go to college because i didn't think that i could afford to spend four years learning to code so i went the self-learning route that's how it all started at least brilliant interesting to hear uh, your take on why you chose the self-learning way to learn to code because yeah a lot of people are in a similar position they don't have four years to spend going back to college. They don't have however many thousands of pounds to spend on a boot camp. So I'm sure lots of people here can relate. What did that journey of learning to code actually look like for you? And how did you decide what to learn? Um, yeah, so it actually was pretty messy, I would say. So initially I did what everything, what everybody else does. I Googled which language was the most popular one to learn and were like, which language should I learn? So I started with uh, JavaScript, which was and is the most popular language. But honestly, mm -hmm. I spent a couple of weeks trying to go through some tutorials about JavaScript and like nothing made sense for me. So uh, it was just time spent. Uh, banging my head uh, against the keyboard, so to say. So um, now I know that the tutorials that I was doing back then weren't really appropriate for somebody who was just very new to coding, completely new to coding. But back then I was really um, not sure whether this is for me because it was clear that I wasn't really grasping even the most fundamental things. Mm -hmm. But then before giving up on the coding thing, I actually remember that a couple of years prior to that, my one of my friends told me about this 
a language called Ruby and the framework Ruby on Rails that was easy to learn and also that allowed you to build websites very easily and quickly. And I decided to give this one a try. So I found a tutorial called Ruby on Rails tutorial that I always recommend uh, that kind of changed the direction of my learning uh, in a way because it, it was the first time when I was doing a tutorial and I could actually understand coding. Uh, and it gave me hope that maybe I can learn it. Maybe I'm not completely hopeless. And once I found this tutorial that works for me, I started doing that. Then, uh, you know, once you start building up some understanding, it becomes a little bit easier to find other things that work for you. So uh, I did a couple of tutorials by the same author. Uh, then I uh, did Code Academy to, uh, courses in Ruby, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, the introductory ones. Then I also worked through a lot of books. So I'm in general big, a big fan of coding books because I think that they provide you with a lot of structure, uh, a lot of logic. Uh, and I think that generally, a lot of books are of a higher quality than some online like YouTube tutorials because there is an editor, there is usually a team uh, invested in the whole book. So the quality is higher and usually the quality of explanations, I would say is much higher. So I worked through quite a lot of books about Ruby, also Ruby on Rails and then RSpec, which is the test and framework for uh, Ruby on Rails. So I did that and then I think, um, and then the next step was to start building my own projects, which I think I did too late uh, because I was stuck in this tutorial hell and kind of book hell uh, world where I was going through tutorials and books and I, was, I felt that I was learning so much and I was, but still I didn't quite understand how little I actually learned. So then I started building my own, uh, my own you know, things like toy projects. And this is when I really saw how little I know and how, like how huge the gaps in my learning still are. But I think that this was like the most important point where I learned, I think, the most. And then after that, uh, I didn't feel ready to apply for jobs or anything like that, but I kind of had to start applying because I wanted to move to Poland as quickly as possible. And I started applying much earlier than I felt I was ready. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you asked me about learning to code, I think a lot of my learning happened during my first job, to be honest. Interesting. So when you say you didn't feel ready to apply for jobs, did you end up getting a job earlier than you expected? Um, I, I don't think I had any kind of specific timeline in place. Overall, it took me nine months to go from zero to being hired, which I think is very fast. But uh, hmm. I... I don't think I had any like milestones for me, like when I want to be hired. It's just that I kind of wanted to do this as, as quickly as possible. Uh, and it's just that I had some like life situation motivated me to, uh, you know, to want to move quickly. So uh, like I had this, I had this external pressure to start applying earlier than I felt comfortable. But to be honest, um, I think that a lot of people start applying too late and they like, it's very hard to start feeling that you are ready because you are so new uh, and, you know, I think that it's easy to wait too long before you start applying. So for me, it didn't feel comfortable going through interviews or doing uh, test challenges, uh, but I'm glad I started doing it early uh, rather than later, because I think that just the process of going through, uh, through the job search also taught me a lot. And then once I started working as a programmer, so like I got this first initial internship, uh, this is when my learning is just accelerated so much because I was like, there was a lot of pressure and kind of, uh, you know, expectations of me being to be productive very quickly. Uh, and this environment really motivated me to learn as quickly as possible. And I think that if I just stayed home uh, doing my own toy projects, I wouldn't have learned as much as quickly. So uh, it was definitely like, you know, when I think back to it now, I'm definitely very happy that I got the job as early as I did. Mm, yeah, I completely agree that it's easy to wait too long, as you said, because when do you feel ready, especially for something like software development? There's no exam to pass or organization to be accepted to. That means you're totally ready. It's just kind of if someone thinks you're up to the job, then you'll probably get the job, but that's so vague. So it's nice to hear your tale of, yeah, getting a job very quickly. That's excellent. Which brings me on to my question here. Well, not my question, <laughs> Programming B's question. Um, wants to get a remote front-end developer job, but has no prior experience. Can you help out in that? So I'm assuming you didn't have any experience when you went for your first job. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with that in the job hunt? 
Uh, yeah, so obviously it was it was very difficult for me to find my first job because I didn't have experience. Also, I didn't have a computer science degree. And on top of that, I was uh, not a Polish citizen and I was based in another country. So there was this layer of me being an immigrant. Like I had a work visa, but also I think that a lot of uh, companies that saw my application, they maybe didn't notice it or something like that. So it was difficult. And I think that some parts of the application didn't make it through because of the immigration question that, uh, as well. So I would say that the way to overcome it for me was to, first of all, have a portfolio, then to have something that helps you stand out a little bit. In my case, uh, I made uh, my own personal website. It was very simple. I just used a constructor. I, like I didn't code my own website from scratch. But I had a website where I displayed my projects, so like a portfolio thing. Then I had a blog on the website where I talked about the things that I have learned while I was building my uh, portfolio projects. And there was a section about me. There was um, some other sections. So I put some time and effort into writing those things up, uh, trying to make it personal, trying to make it a little bit unusual, because I know that um like having a blog is something that a lot of people recommend to junior developers but i think that most people still won't do it so uh if you actually have a blog where you're just blogging about your learning what you're building and things like that it immediately helps you stand out so this is something that i did but also another thing that i did is that um at first i had like an idea of where i wanted to work the like the city where I wanted to be based, like my dream city. Then I had an idea of what companies I wanted to be employed by, but it didn't go anywhere because all of those companies were obviously flooded with applications from people who had experience, who had computer science degrees, who were based in Poland um, and all of that, those things. So I had to get creative. And this is something that I also recommend to people who are just looking for uh, their first job is you need to put yourself in the shoes of your potential employer. Uh, you know, you like you are very unique and special um, kind of, you know, uh, to yourself and, and you know that you're the best person uh, in the world, but they don't know it. And they're just uh, comparing you to other people who maybe have a lot more things going for them uh, in a good way, like like a computer science degree or an internship or maybe some other experience. So if you don't have anything, you need to be creative. And in my case, it was me just making the decision to start applying basically everywhere, not just in places where I really wanted to work, but just any places that were hiring and other places that weren't hiring. I was just writing to um, companies based all over Poland. Uh, I was targeting smaller towns where there wasn't that much competition, smaller web agencies that weren't even hiring for Ruby on Rails. They were hiring for PHP and WordPress development. But for me, it was very important to get this first experience. So I was very flexible in terms of uh, where I work, where I move. So I was open to a lot of possibilities. And I think this is when the, the process really changed for me. So uh, my piece of advice would be to be open-minded and flexible and try to think outside the box. So like have your list of dream companies, but also think of other places where you can apply. So it can be like smaller startups in your area, maybe local businesses, uh, things like that. Maybe try to get some experience with freelance, uh, doing a website for somebody you know, or things like that. Just trying to break into the industry in sort of creative ways. I think this is something that really, really helps. Um, and then networking, I think, really helps. This is something that I didn't didn't do because I wasn't really even based in the country where I needed to network. But if you have this option, networking is great. Meeting people in the industry, going to meetups, building a network on LinkedIn, uh, again, blogging, social media, just doing everything you can to get in touch with as many, as many people in the industry uh, as possible. I think it's the it's the surest way to increase your chances. But also understand that even though um, the market for web developers used to be very hot. Of course, it's currently changing with the you know with the recession and the layoffs, but um, still it is a good market for for developers. But for junior developers, unfortunately, there is still a lot of competition. There is always a lot of competition for jobs. So you gotta think outside the box and think of how you can position yourself um, a little bit separately from the rest. And for every person, it's something different, but. Just thinking of how you can be creative and a little bit unusual uh, in your job search, I think, uh, really helps. Hope I hope this is helpful. Yeah, brilliant. And really interesting to hear about your approach of applying to lots of different places that weren't necessarily your first choice or anything you previously thought of. We often get asked, 
should I tailor my job search to what I really want or should I just go for anything? And I like your explanation of it opening up opportunities that you might not have necessarily thought were good for you, but they might turn out to be, or maybe even things that you didn't know about. So that's interesting to hear that perspective of, um, yeah, casting your net wide, I think. We yeah, get asked, yeah. Mm, yeah, we get asked a lot um, how people can find remote jobs to apply to or reach out to. So I'm wondering what your approach was for that. Um, yeah, what did that look like and how did you find success? Uh, so my initial, my first job wasn't really remote. So it was based in, uh, it was based in Poland. It was an office based job and I had to relocate to Poland uh, to start working there. I mean, I wanted to relocate to Poland, but for the specific job, um, it was also required. Uh, so honestly, I don't think that the process of looking for jobs is that much different. I think the principles for finding a remote job are pretty much the same. I think that right, it also, it was a couple of years ago. So right now I think, a lot more companies are open to remote uh, candidates. So it's, it's, I think it actually it might be a better time to look for jobs because so many companies are flexible and they're, they, now everybody understands what remote work is. I think that back then it was still a little bit like, it's still like companies had to be really like forward thinking to accept this. Uh, but right now I think it's pretty much accepted by most companies that remote work works, not like not everybody, but still there are options. So I think that generally the same kind of advice um, applies. I don't think there is anything specific. Uh, I think that over time I've started thinking more and more about how important social media presence is for junior developers, especially like it's important for everybody. But I think that once you have the experience and you have the kind of the years of experience, you have your uh, you know, commercial experience, your projects, recommendations, like references, I think that it becomes much easier to change jobs. But in the beginning, it's so hard to stand out from the crowd because when we're starting out, we're kind of all at the same level. We have done the same tutorials, this mo more or less the same toy apps, right? So how do you stand out? And I think that uh, showing your personality through some content creation, a blog or YouTube or something like that. So for instance, I started YouTube just a couple of months ago and I really wanted to start it like years ago. And I wish I started it when I was just learning to code because honestly, I think that it would have made things so much easier for me. And also I would have this kind of record of what it was like for me to learn. So if you have a chance to do that, uh, why not? Like you would never regret uh, starting the blog, I think. Uh, and it would help you. Uh, also, I'm a big proponent of being active on LinkedIn. I think that it's a great tool that people don't really use as much as they should. Uh, if you're active there, if you're also publishing content, if you have a good profile, if you're networking with uh, recruiters on LinkedIn, this is something that can help you so much because if you have a network of recruiters uh, and if you publish updates and if you are like open about your job search, it's very likely that somebody in your network would reach out to you with some options for internships or something like that. So I think that this is help. This helps a lot. Uh, and also, I think with time, there are, I've seen that there are more and more apprenticeships uh, being open, remote ones as well, which make it easier for people who are career changers and people who are maybe making uh, a comeback into uh, the industry after like a long career break. I think those things are beginning uh, to happen more and more. So overall, I think that even with the whole uh, kind of economic situation, I think that there are more different ways to break into tech and find jobs with all the boot camps that are appearing and kind of free or, you know, uh, other schemes that would allow you to study. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that uh, hope I hope uh, this answered my question somewhat. Definitely interesting to hear about um yeah, the importance of social media. And I think that's a great way as well, going back to the question of if you don't have any experience, what can you do to compensate for that? If you've got a decent social media presence, a blog with several blog posts or a YouTube channel or whatever it is you want to do, then that at least shows some of your personality, as you said, and your ability and your commitment to learning. So I think that's excellent advice. Yeah, fabulous question from Beza, which I think a lot of people will relate to. It's hard to be confident in interviews when you're a self-taught developer. I guess in general, a lot of people struggle with being confident in interviews, especially if it's the first job you're going for in an industry. But we can look at it from a self-taught developer perspective as well. 
Do you have any tips for conquering those interview nuts? Um, so I don't have tips, but I can say that I, I have become really good with conquering my own nerves uh, during the interviews. I still get really stressed out. Uh, and uh, there are some kind of interviews that just freak me out still. Uh, and it's uh, sometimes I just freeze and panic, but it becomes better with practice. So one thing that I can say is that if you are terrified and not confident right now, it will get better. But still, you will have to, like you have to go through the for initial interviews. So I think that there are like psychological tricks that people advise. So like to be confident is uh, kind of to be in the resourceful mental state before an interview. So to be rested, hydrated, like well fed, and all of that. Just to be like physically, you need to be feel good to feel to feel confident as well. Then there are like exercises, like you know striking the power pose. This is like um, this this pose of a Superman. Maybe you have heard of it. Uh, so this is these are kind of physiological tricks that help you feel a little bit better. And the thing about feeling better and the thing about how we present ourselves, a lot of it comes not we we tend we, we like to think that this is kind of all mind but also a lot of it comes from the body. So if you can trick your body to feel confident by doing the power pose, by doing like a couple of jumps, like power exercises before an interview, this really, really helps because our mind is so much influenced by our body, I think. And also if you are feeling, I think a lot of like lack of confidence, it also is connected with a high level of stress during an interview. And here again, stress is so physical. So if you can do like short exercise, if you're feeling overwhelmed with stress, there is no way for you to just kind of psych you into yourself into feeling confident. You cannot just tell yourself, okay, be calm, be confident. This doesn't work this way. You need to do something physical to let the stress out. This is something that, that I learned kind of fairly recently, but it really works. And then in terms of like, once you're in this physical state of being calm and kind of maybe not completely confident, but at least like feeling, uh, I don't know, normal or adequate. So one thing that helps me is thinking of what my advantages are, like what are my strong uh, points here? So I know that I don't have experience. I know that I didn't go to college to study computer science, but I also did something that is also impressive. So I taught myself to code from zero without like any help. Uh, I think that this shows something about myself that I can learn that I'm persistent, that I'm, you know, um, kind of resilient enough to go through the process. And I think that this some like focus on what you have already achieved to be here. Also, you know that they have invited you to an interview. So it must be because they liked something about you, maybe your projects, maybe your resume or something like that. So they thought that you are worth their time. So you can also treat this as just a way for you to show your skills, but it, don't feel like you are, uh, you know, intruding on their time or like that you are like begging, you know, them for something. It is kind of an exchange of value. And if they're talking to you, maybe they see some potential of you to provide value for them. Even if you are not very qualified right now, probably the company wants to train you and give you time to learn because they see some potential on you to return this value to them in the future. So I think that thinking about this really helps. And then I think that um, what really helps is just having this abundance mentality, not thinking like, okay, this is the only company that replied to me in two months. So I really need to like be really good because like if you put so much emphasis on a company, you kind of get into this mental state of scarcity mentality and thinking, okay, this is just the only company that will ever hire me. And when the stakes are so high, it will be very hard for you to just relax and show your natural self. So uh, I want you just to try to think of like, there are other companies that will reach out to you. There will be other interviews and just treat this as an opportunity to learn and kind of practice. But also I think that practice in interviews is something that I didn't do really uh, like mock interviews uh, i learned about them i think not not that early not that not that long ago that like there are services and like people who can you can practice with and this is something that helps with the nerves so much so if you can do practice interviews with your friend or through some service that exists online i think it's definitely worth the you know the money or the time to do that just to get this thing out of your system because if you have never done technical interviews or like whiteboard or pair programming over zoom or something like that uh, it can be very nerve-wracking. There's just the the fact that this is very unfamiliar to you. So if you can make it a little bit more familiar, I think that this will remove a lot of the stress. 
So yeah, I think to sum up, just focus on removing the stress as much as possible. Uh, prep as much as you can, but don't like, uh, don't overdo it. Like I don't mean, I, like I don't want you to, I don't know, not sleep and just study. Uh, but take time to learn to prep. Uh, and yeah, maybe I hope this those tips will help you, kind of, cope with the nerves and the lack of confidence. Absolutely, and I completely agree that practice really does make interviews easier and if you can't find a service or they're expensive or whatever just go to interviews that will be free or at least it should be um, <laughs> so yeah the, the more you do it really the easier it gets and um, I haven't been to an interview for a while but last time I was in a round of interviews my psychological trick was just to pretend I was on this tv show called The Apprentice which is like a business competition TV show. It's very silly. But it's just, yeah, because the people on it are so ridiculously overconfident and strutting around and everything, I would just, in my mind, pretend I was doing that and that somehow helped. But yes, fabulous advice. Um, really grateful for you sharing that wonderful advice as uh, Mohammed says, Nadia dropping gems, completely agree. Yes. <laughs> Keep the wonderful questions coming in because uh, there are loads of them and they're all brilliant. And I will ask my next one, which is a couple of people have asked this actually. Um, how many projects were enough to land you a job? And someone earlier on was asking, here you go, Hassan, how many projects did you have in your portfolio? Is there a perfect number of projects? Because I guess you don't want too many because then people can't look at them all. Do you want uh, just yeah. one? So for me, I had, I think I had three. So I didn't have mm. a crazy number of projects. And then I think that also, um, I when I was applying for jobs, I wasn't really active in the kind of social media or like Twitter. Like I was following some people, but I wasn't really engaging with a lot of them. And only after I became a software engineer and like changed a couple of jobs, I learned how like how about the level of um, about the quality of people's portfolios that they have when they're looking for their first job. And I was just amazed because I didn't know about what, kind of what the expectations were. I was kind of in my own bubble. So I just made three projects uh, that I thought were somewhat reasonable and showed my skills. So there were a couple like there were pretty basic apps. It wasn't like nothing. I, one of them was like semi-original but others were just kind of standard apps like a project ma uh, project management tool or something like that so it was pretty standard uh, i built it kind of for so I, since i was a journalist it was kind of a project management tool for a small editorial team something like that and also i wrote tests for the code i think that having tests kind of elevated the whole um quality of the projects because other than that i wouldn't say that they were very advanced but i think that uh testing is something that a lot of junior developers don't really uh learn so maybe this was an advantage but yeah i think that one project is too little but then i don't know what the perfect number was i think that right now there is so much more information about what kind of projects people are building and you can find everything online i think it's, it's very easy to get overwhelmed because you might think that your projects are not good enough uh but um honestly uh it's hard, it's hard to give like concrete advice here. I think that once you have a couple of projects that uh, you should focus on just showing your skills like the best that you have right now. So if you have learned like JavaScript to a certain level, try to build a project that shows the, the best skills in JavaScript that you have. Um, and try to make it personal, something that you are interested in, a project that is fun for you to build and then start applying for jobs. And then once you're like one, once you're start applying and going through interviews, uh, continue building your projects, continue expanding them and making them better. But I think that once you have a couple of them, you can start applying. And, you know, if they're not good enough, then the company just doesn't get back to you. But then you can always reapply in a couple of months. There is no ban for you to reapply again. Just follow up, say that you applied three months ago with a couple of projects. But since then, you've learned, for instance, like a new framework and this is a new project. So this might work. But then there are other companies that you haven't really uh, talked to yet. So you can apply to them. So I think it's kind of a process that you need to start at some point. But then just um, keep learning and improving. Uh, and yeah, and then you will get there. Excellent. Especially the advice about adding some testing in. I think that would really stand out, even potentially in mid-level. Some people have avoided testing all that time. So if you are going for a junior job, 
and you've got some testing in there without even being asked I think that would look really really good excellent tip mm -hmm. yeah Arno asked a question which I can relate to and I was going to ask something similar anyway which is I get the whole social media presence thing, but it's tricky as an introvert. A fellow introvert here, Arno, hello, yes. <laughs> totally get that. Um, when I was learning to code, I started a blog. And at first, publishing a blog post was, oh, it used to take me hours because I was proofreading it. And then I was thinking, oh, someone's going to tell me this is wrong and like, all the rest of it. Any tips for overcoming a feeling like that when you want to start a social media presence? Yeah, so I definitely feel it. I'm also an introvert, but I think that having had so much experience with social media and kind of in my previous career as a journalist, uh, I did a lot of social media there. I think it helped me quite a lot to kind of conquer this. Uh, but then I think that what, um, and so right now it's much easier for me to do all the stuff and it doesn't take that much time, I would say. Um, but still doing a lot of the things like like some so i would say that some things are easier for introverts and some are harder so for instance for an introvert it's probably easier to write a blog post than to shoot a uh, you know a youtube video so for me personally uh, i started youtube so that i can also conquer my own fear of being on camera and being like cringed out by my own voice and my face and all of that so and i'm also doing a lot more social media appearances like this stream uh, also to become more comfortable doing all of that. So it kind of also leading into your weaknesses a little bit and uh, finding challenges, but it's a process. So you, you shouldn't like, you know, look at somebody who is on uh, YouTube or something like that and be like, okay, I gotta like, have a YouTube channel if you are not ready for it. Just, you can start small and you can start doing something like a blog post. But also if this is mostly for job search and not for growing your own social media presence, I think that you don't need to worry about like other people reading it really like I had a blog and I don't think anybody read it. I wasn't really promoting it. I was just writing for kind of for my, for my own self, but also uh, for, you know, for the job search. So I knew that it would increase my chances and I wanted to, to do that basically. So you can think of it uh, as this way, but then, you know, maybe you will actually like it and you will find some readers or followers and then you will grow into that. Uh, so also I think that, uh, what helps is if you are thinking, uh, so there are like, there, like there is a book called uh, still like an artist, which is, which also helps people, I think a lot to overcome this, um, feeling that you are, you know, if you're an introvert and then you're online kind of selling yourself, a lot of people have a problem with that. So, um, the book is kind of about not that this is not about selling yourself. It's actually about helping people solve their problems. So if you are new software engineer and you are now learning some framework, for instance, and you found like a nice way to achieve something in it, or you found a way to fix a bug that you like, you spend a day fixing the bug and then you write a blog post about fixing this bug. Like there is no, like wh where is the self-promotion? Where is the kind of the selling of yourself? You're just sharing something that others might benefit from. And then people will actually Google this issue. They will be helped by your answer. And, um, that's it. So you've just solved their problem. And a lot of the content that people publish is actually about solving other people's problems. And it can be educational, entertainment, or kind of motivational. So a lot of my content, for instance, is about motivation and kind of helping uh, self-taught engineers find confidence and find uh, strength in themselves to move forward. So I think that you need to kind of reframe this thinking of I'm uncomfortable selling myself into, I, I want to help people still. And you can choose a format that just works for you. It can be a text blog where like nobody sees your face. It can be anonymous. Like uh, there are so many different ways to do that. You can have a Twitter profile that just use a, uses some uh, pseudonym or something like that if you're not comfortable sharing your face or anything like that. So fortunately there are ways to do that without like being exposed or sharing too much. And also you always choose how much you share, you know? I was on mute the whole time. <laughs> that was a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Speaking of content uh, you create, you have made this book, uh, Crossing the Rubicon, How to Learn to Code and Build a Programming Career. Can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this book and who it's aimed at? 
yeah, sure. So basically, the kind of I wish the book, this book existed when I was learning to code, and the audience for this book are basically people like me who are learning to code and coming to coding from um, non-traditional backgrounds, from uh, non-STEM backgrounds, basically. So it is beneficial for people who have some backgrounds in technology, obviously, but I think that the target audience are people who are uh, very new to the field, who don't have the confidence, who don't have the kind of the supporting um, supportive network around them. So when I was learning to code, I was really lacking uh, this kind of uh, group uh, a supporting um, network around me. So this book is meant to be a mentor and a friend for people who are feeling uh, lost and lonely. Maybe you don't know anybody who taught themselves to code. Uh, like I didn't know anybody who taught themselves to code at the older age. So basically what I was feeling when I started writing the book, like the motivation for it was that I couldn't really find any content, any books who were written by people who were like me, who came to coding later in life, uh, who didn't have any interactions with technology before that, who started learning from zero. And by zero, I mean like a complete zero. So I didn't have computer science degree uh, education in school or in college. So it was like me coming in fresh. I couldn't understand what the variable was. And it was pretty shocking because I didn't like, how did I pass algebra? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it happened. But when I started coding, like all of the foundational things like a loop or like an e-file statement, it was just like mind blowing for me. And I couldn't really find content uh, written by people who were like me showing that it is actually possible to go from being a completely clueless person to being employed as a software engineer by like big name companies. So this is why I created the book. I wanted to show that it's possible that you can grow up uh, in an environment that was, uh, so, so my background was growing up like in a pretty poor country uh, without having access to technology. Uh, so I tell a story in this book, I tell a story about my childhood. Uh, and I think that people who are growing up in countries that are um, not very privileged, they would be able to relate to the story that I'm telling. Uh, so my family couldn't afford a computer until I was 15. Uh, like I didn't have like, you know, you read the stories of people like tinkering with their computers in their garage or something like that. And it wasn't at all my background. And still, I wanted to show that no matter your background, you can still make it work if you apply yourself. Because right now, this industry is so uh, permissionless. Um, there is little, so there is like, there is some gatekeeping, but I think with a lot of gatekeeping, we do ourselves to ourselves. So uh, right now, a lot more companies don't care about computer science degrees. So it means that if you have internet access, uh, you can learn to code and you can at least uh, get the skills and then probably uh, get the job as well and build a career if this is something that you're interested in. So yeah, that was the motivation for the book. Uh, and the book is basically two things. It's my own personal story of how I went from being no technical to being employed as a coder. And then it's also a kind of a how-to guide how anyone can learn to code, find a job. And also I share some of the tips that I learned for like for newer uh, programmers, things that I wish somebody told me when I was learning. Um, and yeah, it kind of ends with me being um, very happy at my previous job. So. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's time for part two. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, sounds very inspiring indeed. And leads me on to a nice question from um, Asad, which is, how does it feel when you don't have a technical background, but you're working alongside people who maybe do? Um, yeah, that's the question, really. <laughs> uh, yeah, so actually, this is something that I talk about uh, in the book uh, as far mm. as I remember. Yeah, I do. I, it, it is. Um, so there are two ways to look at it. So I've had experience working with people who actually at my previous job, I think most engineers in my team had computer science degrees. A lot of them had master's degrees in computer science from top Polish universities. So one way to look at it is just to be intimidated and just to feel really bad about myself. But another way is to be um, to flip this thinking and think like, OK, I get access to people who are brilliant, who have spent years being taught by the best professors of computer science, and I'm working with them so I can learn from them for free, but not even for free, I'm getting paid to learn from them. Um, I mean, to work, but also you can learn from them. So once you start thinking of this this way, so a lot of it is kind of changing the, your mindset. So yes, you don't have the degree, 
uh, because probably you were doing something else. It means that you have some professional experience or life experience that those people uh, don't have. So maybe you can bring something else to the team. So you can think of the way of the things that only you can do and people who um, don't have your experience can't. And this is kind of your unique selling proposition for the team. But also you can be a good learner. You can be a good colleague. Uh, you can be helpful to everybody and kind of bring as much value as possible. But I think that if you have this mindset of, seeing everybody as a teacher in the industry uh, and being like really open and being like a child who's learning, like not thinking of kind of like, you know, one way that I could have seen this was like, okay, I'm joining a team. I'm the oldest person in the room, but also I'm like the stupidest person. Like all the senior developers are younger than me and I'm a junior like intern and I have no idea what's happening. But also there is another way to look at it and kind of accept the fact that you are, you know, perhaps the worst engineer in the team, but also it won't be this way forever. So I think that one tip, one tip that I share with uh, junior programmers is that, you know, if you're like looking for somebody to say that like you're allowed to be the worst, like I can give you this permission, you're allowed to be the worst for a while, uh, but it will change, like it won't be this way forever. And actually, if you feel that you are like always, um, there's this advice that you can, that you should always be like the stupidest person in the room. And if you don't feel this way, you should find another room. Uh, meaning that you should always try to be surrounded by people who are much smarter than you. Um, this is also a tip that I, I think um, I would share. Absolutely. I love that learning mindset you've got there. Because it is easier, especially as an adult, to feel bad about struggling to learn something. So, for example, I learned to snowboard a few years ago and I remember just getting so frustrated when it didn't work out the first time or the 10th time or the 20th time but then I thought when I was a child learning to ride a bike or roller skates it took ages and I wasn't getting angry at myself for not doing it or feeling like oh I'm a failure because I haven't mastered it after two tries or whatever so I think your tip about learning like a child is actually a really nice one yeah and um, nice question here from Zuhair, which is uh, harking back all the way to the beginning of the stream. You mentioned that you started off with JavaScript, found it a bit of a nightmare, um, and switched to Ruby. A lot of people struggle with JS, but I think it's difficult to really know why. Do you know what it was about JS that you found tough to understand? And is that something you've kind of identified later? Or was it at the time you just thought, this is ridiculous, <laughs> I'm going to switch? I think that I started also with wrong tutorials. So for some reason, I started doing tutorials on ExpressJS, which is like the backend framework uh, to work with JavaScript, based on JavaScript. And the tutorials were about building a server in ExpressJS. And then there was like, there was something about Node.js. But at that point, I had no concept of what the server was, like what was happening. So I think that a lot more of it was about me not understanding what was happening overall, uh, like not as much the language being complex. So I would say that once I switched to Ruby, I think that in my personal opinion, I think Ruby is a much more beginner friendly uh, language in terms of, uh, I think that there are things there just, um, it's a tough question actually. So I think that one way to think about it is that you would find a lot of videos on YouTube or you know flying around like discussing like weird things about JavaScript. And those weird things are kind of funny and, you know, can make jokes of, about them once you're experienced and you understand JavaScript. But once, when you're learning all those weird things, they are just a little bit of a, they create friction and you understanding it. So I think that JavaScript has changed quite a lot since then. Uh, and I think that it's becoming uh, like objectively a much uh, better language. Uh, but still, I think that there were, there was kind of too much friction and too much like weirdness around it. And with Ruby, I think that the like the whole like even the syntax is like very clean and things just kind of made sense for me initially, or you know, from the beginning. But then once I went back to uh, JavaScript, once I had the basics of Ruby and Ruby on Rails, I think it was much easier to to understand it. Uh, and then and since then I kind of went full stack, uh, but I still I'm more partial to Ruby and I enjoy coding uh, the backends much more still. <laughs> That's great, though, to hear that you found something, you were struggling for whatever reason, 
that rather than give up on coding completely, you're like, well, there's so much in the tech industry to learn. I just try out something else. And that worked out well. So nice tip there. On the subject of um, what to learn, Mohammed says, um, battling with JS and React while also forgetting CSS. <laughs> now, this is something I can definitely relate to. You think, yeah, you've nailed one technology, so you'll move on to the next, and then you spend a month on that, and then you go back to the first one, and you're like, oh, what was this again? How can you avoid that and get an all-rounded coding education? Indeed, is that possible? What was your approach when you were learning? Um, I think that when, so when, when my first job, it was actually a sort of full stack because it was Ruby on Rails, but then the front end I was doing, doing was actually in jQuery. So I had to write JavaScript code uh, from the get-go. I think that if you are doing both things at the same time, so for instance, in my current job, um, I am expected to write both backend code and front end code. And if it cha if you are like doing one week of backend and the next week of front end, then it kind of stays in your head for you know as long as necessary. But still, if you take breaks from using a certain technology, so if I take a break from using Ember.js, which I use at work, um, it, it, I think it naturally happens that you forget a lot of the stuff if you're not using it, especially if some of the things are just like quirky and they don't really make much sense, but it's just the way the framework works. This, those things are very easy to forget. So I think that um, I think that this is something that experienced programmers struggle with quite a lot. It's just that when you come back to a technology after not using it, you feel rusty a little bit in it. And you have to spend some time just getting back into the flow. And it just involves Googling the same thing for hundreds of time and kind of getting back into it. But I think that it's the kind of never ending struggle uh, of forgetting stuff. It's just that our brain, I think that it's much better for creating idea for like coming up with ideas other than holding things in. Um, but also I, I don't think that you have to worry too much about forgetting some things about CSS or React or something like that. I think that a lot of people who are just learning to code, they, so I've heard of people trying to memorize all HTML tags, for instance. Uh, and I think that it comes from not really understanding what's important. So the important thing is to understand the fundamental principles of the technology. So if, if you're learning a framework, try to focus on the kind of the fundamental principles around it. So like, what is a tag, for instance, or what is the property if it's CSS? And then once you understand the fundamentals of it, it will be very easy for you to Google a specific property and how to write it. Uh, or if you're like learning Flexbox, for instance, try to understand like the kind of the building blocks of it. And then you can always Google, uh, you know, that CSS tricks article that we always open when we're working with Flexbox. So, um, yeah, I think that in my experience, I've seen that like software engineers, they forget stuff all the time and it's something completely natural, uh, happens to everybody seniors as well. That's right. And even if you did learn absolutely every tiny thing about a language, there's going to be something new added in the next six months or something's going to be deprecated. So you'll still end up Googling. So as you said, uh, the most important thing is to understand the fundamentals and then you'll always know what's going on. One question which has got quite a bit of attention in the chat is from Mehmet, who asked, uh, which one do you think is better? A person who is a good developer, but has no communication skills, creative thinking skills, etc. so soft skills really, um, or vice versa. So the person with the decent soft skills, not so hot on the development side. Uh, I think that a lot depends on the company and kind of the goals uh, that the person has. I think that everybody, like every successful uh, software engineer, they have they need to have a certain like base level of technical skills and the base level of communication skills. So I know that some people like have zero communication skills and they are good coders and they still can kind of build the career. But I think that the number of companies where those people can prosper is very limited because I think that bigger and kind of big name companies, they place a lot of a lot of importance on the soft skills. So if you really want to build like a remarkable career uh, and to kind of go places, you need to work on your soft skills. But also you still have to have the technical skills. So um, the way to think about it is that at many big tech companies, so for instance, like Intercom, 
when you are evaluated, uh, your performance gets evaluated every six months. So, and there are usually frameworks of how people are kind of assessed in a way. And there are things there that are like completely technical. So for instance, like how much code, like how much value you can produce with your code. So like how quickly you can execute on some, uh, you know, product decisions, for instance. So this is important, but also there are whole kind of competences around communication, teaching people, building partnership around the company. So you will be also judged on them and it won't be possible for you to get uh, promoted at big, at big companies and kind of, you know, good companies if you are completely failing some of those skills. So I think that there is like really, um, but also like, of course, you can find a company where you can be like a really bad engineer and kind of just be friends with everybody and still keep the job. So I think that it kind of, you can be any kind of engineer. And I think that the the industry is so huge that kind of any kind of person can find a place to work. But I think that the question is like, what are your goals? And if you want to be really successful and build a remarkable career that lasts uh, years and you're happy in it, you probably want to be in the companies where both things are important, both technical skills and soft skills. And you want to be working with people who have some technical skills and some soft skills. So, sorry, the answer is that you kind of have to work on both, unfortunately, or fortunately. Yeah, perfect answer. We have eight minutes left and tons of amazing questions. So I'm wondering if we can do a quick fire round <laughs> um, yeah, to get through as many of these wonderful questions as possible. Let's see how many we can do sure. in the remaining eight minutes. Um, let's start, I'll start from the top of my little list. Zalza Wynn wants to know how to manage your time learning new things and working on projects. I think that any like good good time management uh, principles apply or uh, time time block in your calendar kind of marking the time that you plan on learn to work on learning and time that you plan to spend on working on projects cutting out distractions like social media make sure that you have as much time and energy as possible but also maybe cutting out some other things that you are used to doing but maybe you shouldn't do anymore like things like netflix and other distractions so there is no magic uh tip here is just finding more time to do the things that are important to you. Perfect. Um, Arm is asking, when searching for developer jobs, I frequently see strong DSA skills. DSA, uh, I know what it is. <laughs> something, something algorithms. Data science and algorithms. Um, how to improve the, all right, yeah. <laughs> how to improve this area. Uh, yeah, so one book that really helped me was called Common Sense Guide to Data Structures and Algorithms. So this is a book that explains those topics for people who have no background in uh, math or computer science. So this is the book that I recommend. Everybody else will recommend the uh, Cracking the Code and Interview book. This is a book that was completely impenetrable to me. So um, yeah. I think that it's very, it's very, compl it's very complex. Uh, so it's it, it's not very beginner friendly. So I recommend that. And there is also the Grokin uh, algorithms with the animals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was mentioned recently is. on the on the stream. Yeah. So um, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> that, is, that is that is also more beginner friendly. And then Elite Code, you can do the kind of the easy. So there are questions that are easy, meet difficulty, and very hard. And you can start with the easy ones and do them. This was very helpful for me when mm -hmm. I was learning and there are websites that teach you those things like Algo Expert is one that I used. So uh, you can check that out as well. Perfect. Lots of fab resources there. Good luck, Arnach. Mohammed, um, happy to be here. I've already asked that. Yes, good. Very, skip to the next one. Um, <laughs> Zuhe, how much time did you spend in hours each day when you started and later? So when I started learning, I actually was in a position where I could study and work on my projects full time, um, not like without breaks, but I didn't have to work. So uh, that was fortunate. But basically, it was a full time study thing. And this allowed me to go from zero to being employed in just 10 months. But basically, as much time as you can, I think that people usually study like for four hours if they're working or something like that. But it, dep like, it depends so much on your current situation, family commitments and all of that. So it's hard to give advice. Um, so and afterwards, what I did in my when I was employed, I would try to time block time in my calendar again uh for learning so during work or like before work to make sure that i'm still kind of learning and developing my skills even though i'm already employed 
a lot of employers actually allow you to study during work time um, if you know if you're coping with your work. So this is something that you can also do uh, as well. Brilliant. Yes. Now this is probably quite a big question, but never mind. I'll ask it anyway. After you land the job, is it all smooth sailing, or do you work just as hard to get to whatever the next step is? Well, you know, if this was like smooth sailing, like those jobs wouldn't be paid as much and wouldn't be so hard to get. It's still it's still very hard. Uh, like the job gets hard in different ways. So obviously you have experience and you know the code, like the programming language, and you know how the things work. But then the higher up you move in the career ladder, the challenges change and you have to learn new stuff all the time. So for instance, somebody who's like a senior engineer or a staff level or a principal level, they have to solve problems that they have never solved before. And also they are kind of on top. So they're more or less alone there and they take responsibility for big decisions. So I think that the it becomes easier in some ways, but then you have to work on other skills. And I think that it's always a challenge. And this is why a lot of people kind of love this industry so much. And this is also the reason why so many people burn out and like leave the industry and go live in the forest. Uh, because it's like, it's always hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. It's lonely at the top. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dario is asking, uh, is it more helpful to go full stack to land a front to well, land a job, I guess, or just stick to front end? Um, I don't really have like a good answer to that. I think that if you already know full, uh, if you already know front end, a lot of I think most people start with front end. So if you already know it, you can start applying for front end jobs and kind of improving. And then if you can throw in some back end skills on top and start applying for full stack jobs, I think that it like it it, it certainly increases your chances because you can apply for more jobs. But then uh, there's also an argument to be made that it's better to be specialized and really understand something really well. So if you're just a beginner, maybe it makes more sense to focus on understanding front end. And then once you're comfortable, learning back end skills uh, as well. Um, so yeah, hope, hope this, this helps. Brilliant, yes. And finally, Sarah says, hi, Nadia, nice to see you on the live stream. I enjoyed the episode with you on the Scrimba podcast, which is right here. If you would like some more wonderful advice from Nadia, you can go and check that out after this stream. Nice little segue into there. Thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> yes, Sarah <laughs> is asking if you could go back and do one thing differently in your journey, what would that be? I think that if I could go back in time, I would certainly find a mentor early, um, find an industry mentor, somebody who has been in the software industry for a couple of years, if you're a beginner, um, and get to talk to them as early as possible. Share your frustrations, like share what's going on in your first job or your second job, like ask your own questions, whether you should change a job, whether you should stay, like what should you do? Uh, this is something that I would definitely recommend to anybody starting out because it just makes it so much easier. Like this journey is so hard, but it doesn't have to be this hard. You can find support with mentors, study groups, or like online communities, but just don't do this alone. It's It can be much easier. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And thank you everyone who joined and asked all these wonderful questions. There were tons of them. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And I'm very happy to have had you on this stream, Nadia, sharing all that wonderful advice. So thank you very much. And I'm sure everyone watching is also very grateful. If you enjoyed this, let us know with the thumbs up button and maybe hit subscribe for the next stream because uh, we have Busting Tech Jargon with Michael, the senior dev. He's looking very happy about busting some jargon because if there's one thing that frustrates him, it's endless acronyms and unknown words that nobody understands. So that's what we're trying to help you with next week. And before that, we're coding a shopping cart. Yes. <laughs> well, so join us on Friday and see how we get on. Well, thanks once again for joining us, Nadia. Any closing so much thoughts? Um, that you caught me off guard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think that what I want to say is that I think you're already doing, uh, everybody listening to this, you're already doing a great thing. You're joining uh, live streams like this. You're connecting with people. You're kind of involved with the community. Please continue doing this. Don't do this alone uh, like I did. Uh, it gets so hard mentally. I think that there are so many resources online like about tech. You can learn everything online. And like there is too, like, there is too, mu like, too, mu too much, too many resources. So uh, I think at some point, 
but um, I think that the most important thing is just managing your mental state uh, to be in the state of positivity and the, believing that you can do it. It must. It might be very hard, but still uh, surrounding yourself with people who are doing the same thing as you are and kind of not being alone in your own head, seeing that it's possible, following people who have done what you're trying to do. I think this is something that really helped me when I was just learning. Um, and yeah, and just believing that it's possible uh, and not giving up. Perfect. That is a sentiment I can definitely get behind. Thank you so much for coming and I'll see everyone next time. Bye for Thank now. You.